Okay, today we'll take a deep dive into the complexity surrounding identity propagation and API security in microservices environment. We'll explore our current workarounds and their issues. Then we'll see how a novel, relatively unknown, and under-implemented extension of OS2 might help us to solve our problems. At the end, we'll also demo the solution. So my name is Ahmed. And I'm Yara. And we're both from Tyke, an open source API gateway and management platform. I've been here for coming on seven years now, uh, starting as a consulting engineer for our prospects and customers, and then um, moved into product leadership. And now my focus is on R&D, where my team and I are looking a little further ahead strategically uh, to help shape the future of our product offering. I was a C++ developer most of my career, but I needed a change and decided to cross the lines and work with the users directly. I joined Tyke three weeks before I met. <laughs> and also, also as a consulting engineer. Later on, I moved into product leadership as well. As a head of developer experience, we're focusing on creating SDKs, CLIs, and other dev tools to enhance our users' experience. Okay, let's get started. When I visit an online, service, an online store and wish to place an order, as far as I'm concerned, I'm just placing an order via some web app. I'm completely oblivious to the different chains of event and communication between services or different providers that are involved in order to fulfill my transaction. If we zoom in a little bit, this slide shows what the world looks like from perspective of a service, which is responsible for processing an order. A service, such as an order microservice, can use and consume many other services, some internal ones, like inventory, pricing, and user account, and other third-party APIs, such as fraud checker, shipping, CRM, and payments. Some services, um, Sorry, but there are other services that might benefit. Sorry, I'm a bit <laughs> nervous. Some services, such as shipping services, are happy to just accept an, a simple API key in order to integrate with this, that service. They don't need any, to know anything about the user, apart from perhaps the deliver postcode. But other services might benefit from knowing who the user is. Perhaps would include a, this would include a CRM or a fraud checker. Some services, such as shipping, need, need the user's address, book to, address uh, to book a delivery or make a payment, while others, third parties like a fraud checker, that are on less trusted domain, would need to be downgraded to read-only access rights. We can see that the microservice environment is complicated and convoluted with diverse security and users' needs. Let's dig in a little deeper into this. So, identity propagation refers to the process of maintaining consistent user identity across various systems, services, or components within a software application or a networked environment. In distributed systems or microservice architectures, where different, if I can hear myself echo, I'm gonna swap over. <laughs> where, sorry, uh, consistent user identities um, across various systems, services, or components within a software application or a networked environment. In distributed systems or microservice architectures, where different services might be responsible for, different, uh, for handling different various parts of a user's interaction, it's crucial to ensure that the user's identity is accurately propagated throughout the system. And this allows each service to uh, properly authenticate and authorize the user without repeatedly prompting for credentials. Identity propagation typically involves mechanisms such as auth tokens, where users are authenticated by some central authority which issues tokens like a JSON web token or an OAuth token representing their identity. And then these tokens are typically passed between different services to prove that user's identity. We also have single sign-on systems, which enable users to log in once and access multiple related systems without having to re-authenticate. The user's identity is propagated seamlessly across the various services integrated with that single sign-on solution. Then finally, sessions are established upon uh, user authentication, and a session identifier is used to maintain that user's identity as they interact with the different parts of the system. So session management ensures that the user's identity remains consistent within that same session. 
Now, middleware components like API gateways and service mesh data planes, they intercept requests and add identity-related information before forwarding them to upstream services. And this um, ensures that each service has access to the user's identity without explicitly passing it in every request. So along with identity, um, there's contextual information related to the user's session or request, like roles, permissions, permissions preferences, etc. And they may also need to be propagated across the system to ensure consistent behavior and proper authorization decisions. Identity propagation is essential for maintaining security, providing a seamless user experience, and enabling effective authorization and access control mechanisms in distributed systems. So how do we go about propagating identity across our systems? Oh, we've gone back. Yeah, next. Oh, back. <laughs> okay. Oh. Okay, now in this slide, we'll discuss entitled workarounds and hacks. Many of these approaches could actually be okay depending on the situation and use case, but there are a few approaches which we have seen out in the wild. First one is user ID token as access token. Amit, what's wrong with that? So we've all seen many tutorials and implementations um, on the internet which have recommended this approach. This approach is probably one of the simplest to implement because once the user has authenticated and a client has obtained an ID token, then they're able to use that token in order to access the protected resource. But there are several reasons why it's not best practice to use an ID token in this way. Like, the first one is the purpose. ID tokens and access tokens serve different purposes in the OpenID Connect and OAuth2 protocols. ID tokens are intended to provide information about the authenticated user, while access tokens are, uh, are, used to protect, uh, are used to access protected resources on behalf of the user. So mixing their purposes can lead to confusion and potential security vulnerabilities. Access tokens also, they typically have a shorter lifespan um, than ID tokens, and they may have different security requirements. For example, access tokens, they might need to be refreshed. Um, they might need to be revoked, uh, revoked in the case of the user logging out, or maybe a security incident, or, um, or have specific soaps, scopes and permissions associated with them. Access tokens are used to authorize access to specific resources or APIs based on the scopes granted during the authentication process. And ID tokens don't provide the same level of authorization information that are primarily focused on authentication. Using ID tokens as access tokens could result in improper authorization decisions. Okay, so now I'm convinced. We will use access tokens in order, to, in order to, uh, for client to access uh, protected resources. But why can't we just embed all the, all the uh, all the required identity claims into an access token and share that and share that same access token between all the microservices. So the JWT specification specifies um, AZP and AUD claims which enable us to control and understand who the authorized party is and who the intended recipients are. Sharing access tokens is like sharing your password with everybody you talk to and then trusting that the recipients will be good citizens. From the recipient's perspective, the access token is private to that intended recipient or audience. And as a recipient, you should be checking that the token was in fact intended for you. Um, because if it's not, then that token shouldn't be authorized to access the protected resources that you're serving. So by sharing access tokens, even between trusted services, you could be granting overly permissive rights. In our e-commerce store, should a random service like I don't know, let's say a, a product inventory service, be able to access or even perhaps modify a user resource? Should it be pay capable of initiating payments? Okay, so we won't share the same access token with other microservices like a hot potato. Fine. So if every microservice has the ability to authorize itself, then what's wrong with propagating identity and other contextual information as request headers? Well, this is better, and it's not necessarily bad per se, but then how do you go about verifying that a client didn't self-declare self their administrative permissions? How do you verify that headers haven't been manipulated? Or um, there's, there's a lot of manual checks and balances, like you know header request signing, 
And these are complex and they're non-standard approaches which might just about work, but they're difficult to scale. A small change could open up a, a completely new attack vector. These approaches might have, work, might have worked when we cared about the perimeter security when we took monolithic approach. But when we, with the introduction of microservices and consum consumptions of SaaS services, the perimeter can no longer be well defined. We, may, we, have to, uh, we have to aim to achieve zero trust architecture in a consistent and scalable way. So we think that the token exchange can solve this for us. And this specification extends the OAuth2 protocol to enable clients to exchange one access token with another via an authorization server. And why would we want to do that? And what does token exchange enable for us? So we have a few use cases. First one, enabling user impersonation. A client can impersonate as a user. This is useful when an administrator needs to rerun a task if, as if they were a user. Next one is internal to internal token exchange. A client can exchange an existing token created for a specific client for a new token targeted for a different client. This could be useful in case you want less permissive access rights when the service is calling another service. Internal, token, internal to external token exchange. A client can exchange an existing token for an external token, such as a linked Google account. And the last one, external token to internal token exchange. A client can exchange an external minted, externally minted token for internally minted token. This is very useful when your resource server does not understand your issuer, the issuer of your access token, or when you need to convert a SAML to a JWT, and even enrich the access token with new user claims. Okay, so now let's go through the sequence diagram to see, to see how the token exchange works. Do you want to point, please? Yeah. Okay, so um, before the exchange, an auth client has already received an initial token that represents the user authorization. This may have been via a client credential flow or an authorization code or another mechanism. This is written in, in, um, in green. The client then, the client requests token exchange from the authorization server. This request includes that initial token and may, and may specify desired scopes and intended audience or other properties for the new token. Then the, author the authorization server validates the token exchange, the token exchange request. This involves authenticating the user if required and then authorizing the, the token exchange based on the initial token and the requested parameters. If the request is valid and authorized, the authorization server will issue a new token for the client. This new token will have different, might have different uh, scopes, different audience, and other properties based on the exchange parameters. If the request is invalid or unauthorized, and the authorization server will respond with an error. And at the end, the client now can use the new, access, the new exchange token to access the protected resource or, uh, from the resource server. So now, if the demo gods are willing, Ahmet will show us how to manually perform the token exchange. Okay, so um, I'm gonna show, can you guys see my mouse? That might be easier, yeah. So I'm gonna show you an example, a, a token exchange request. The request um, gets sent to the token endpoint um, of the authorization server. And in this case, we use, because we're at KubeCom, we're using Keycloak. And um, the, the request contains the client ID um, and the client secret of the client performing the exchange. And you'll see that we have a new grant type um, called, uh, I'm just gonna call it token exchange for short, but it's grant type URN, IETF, params, OAuth, grant type, token exchange. And Finally, we've included the subject token, which is the access token that we initially received in order to, um, to access this service. Now, let's, um, let's go ahead and see this working in action. We're gonna do it manually. Hopefully, um, the demo gods are on my side. Can you tell me if this is large enough for you? Um, make it larger, right, let's hope I can. Is that better? Okay, and is this okay, or is that too big, or is that? 
That's fine, perfect, okay. So um, before we do the token exchange, we have to um, authenticate the, you know, the, the very first um, request needs to be authenticated and authorized. So we have to, I've already set up Keycloak here with my own uh, users. Let's log back in. Don't worry, I've got super insecure credentials, but I'm on local host, so um, well, I've already got a user set up here. And so um, I've configured a client inside Keycloak, and it's just um, called WebApp. And this is the, I suppose, the, um, I suppose the, the browser application, and we're going to be using, or, or, or Postman in this, in, in this use case. And this is a, um, an authorization code. We're going to be doing the authorization code flow. And the client, which is going to be performing the token exchange, is what we call Tight Gateway. And I've, the way that I've set it up like this is because of the, the following demos after. Um, so, so, yeah, so that's basically it. If we head over, um, we're going to just log in via the web app. So this is just the authorization code flow. And I'm going to make that a little bit bigger so we can see what's going on here. And under auth, we can see that I'm configuring, um, I can, if I scroll up, you can see it's just a re regular um, authorization code flow with uh, Postman as the um, callback URL. And then um, we have the regular authorization uh, URL and the token URL there. And it's the client ID, so it's the web app that's, um, um, that's authenticating. So this is just a regular authorization code flow. I go ahead and get a new access token, and then I'm asked to sign in. So let's go ahead and do that. And go ahead and log in. Woohoo, it worked. And proceed, and I now have an access token. So let's go ahead and have a look at what this access token looks like inside. So I can copy that, and we can paste that into jwt.io. And we can see in this access token, does that need zooming in as well? Is that OK? One more. Cool. Um, and what we can see is that when we generated this access token, this is because of the way that we've configured uh, Keycloak already, um, that the authorized party is the web app. We've got my identity um, in here, in this access token, and the intended audience for this token is Tight Gateway. So that means that Tight Gateway is allowed to accept this, um, th this client is allowed to accept this access token. Um, and now, what we want to do is perform a token exchange, and we're going to do that manually. So let's go ahead and copy this token, and we're going to do an exchange of this access token with the body. Bear with me for a moment. I'm going to, I might have to just zoom out a little bit because I don't have much real estate here. And I'm going to replace that sub, uh, the token in here with the new access token that we received. And we're using in here the credentials of the, um, uh, uh, different credentials of the client. And we can go ahead and send that request. And you'll see that now the client has performed the token exchange and obtained a completely new access token. So if we copy this um, access token, oh, let's hope it copied or not. I'll copy it again. No, I'm suffering here. Copy that, and we paste that in there. And you can see that now the authorized party is the Tyke Gateway. So this is a completely different um, client that, um, that's authorized. So, but we've managed to propagate the identity of, the, um, uh, of my user when I authenticated. Um, so that's the, 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 the most basic use case of the token exchange. Do you want to jump ahead now? And we can now build on this a little bit more. Okay, <clears throat> okay so we've seen how the mechanism work, works. For this talk, Amit and I also created a native middleware for Thai Gateway. Which, which can perform for us this token exchange automatically. Rather than passing around the web app's access token, the gateway as the API, gate, the gateway, as the API gateway performs token exchange 
using its own credentials. And because of, because of the way in which we, uh, it has been set up in Kicklock, we're able to automatically secure and propagate the user identity into the gateway's access token. Using this impersonation semantics, it is, also, it is almost as if the user who originally gave permission to the web app has actually given permissions to the gateway. So this JSON document represents a, 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 configuration of Tyke, a, a configuration for Tyke API Gateway, which tells Tyke to validate an inbound access token and then exchange that for, for a new token. You can see here, um, as, as part of the API definition, the token exchange option object, and we can see minimal setting required for performing token exchange against Kicklock, the authorization server. The target URL in this example is HTTP bin service. This service is an echo server which helps us uh, with this demo as it allows us to see the content of the request when it's received from the gateway. Okay, and okay, perfect. So we're going to go ahead and show us um, how, this, how this is working now. So let's open up my next collection which is um, login and request. And I'm going to close that collection to give us a bit more space and make that a little bit smaller. Authorization. This is really difficult now. OK. So let's go ahead and do that get new access token to authenticate. Oh, hold on a minute. I've done it wrong already. Bear with me for a moment. Let's log out my user. Do I need to log out for this example? No, I don't, do I? Sorry. <laughs> and we can go ahead and use that token in our request. And what that's done is pasted the token here. And we're going to access the HTTP bin service via, um, via the gateway. So now when we send the request, and the gateway has now received the request, it's uh, validated our initial access token that was issued by Keycloak, exchanged that token for a new token, and then proxied that request onto HTTP bin. And we can now see that we've got a, a different access token here. And this access token that was received by um, HTTP bin, if we paste that into jwt.io, Um, so we can see that the gateway, in fact, was the authorized party. So using this, it's really, really seamless, and we recommend, or we, we would like to see more gateways and more service mesh um, um, services implementing these kinds of capabilities. Okay. Okay. Um, so in our previous example, we used the gateway to protect the perimeter and exchange an inbound access token for a new token, which could be used internally. It's also possible to exchange a Kicklog token for an external token minted by an externally identity provider. Consider a situation where our web app application possesses an, an access token issued by a default identity provider, our Kicklog, which is in a trusted domain, but now our application needs to access Google Calendar APIs which, <clears throat> which, as, <clears throat> sorry, which, as we all know, is residing in Google's domain and secured by Google. Our application must obtain a secure token from Google to access the, the Google API. This is another great use case for token exchange grant type, just that this one involves two identity providers, which requires existence of a trust relationship between the two, the two of them. So let's quickly go through this flow. First, the user authenticates with Keycloak. Then, Keycloak issues an access token to the web app. And you can see the, the issuer is Keycloak. Then the web app sending, is using the Keycloak and, uh, and making a, an API call to the API that sits behind Thai Gateway using the access token it got from, from Keycloak. Then, in number four, the gateway is doing a token exchange against Kicklock, which is its own, its identity provider, and it's using that original Kicklock uh, token. 
key clock on its turn, and in its turn exchange, does the token exchange again against Google. And Google returns the, the Google token and then propagate it to, the, to key clock and key clock to the gateway. With that, the gateway can reverse proxy uh, to the service that is now using, is using the Google token and can access the Google calendar. And now we can see this in action. So here, we have an API definition. It looks almost like the previous one, but with the exception of the target of the URL pointing to Google. Mm. No, it doesn't work. Here. OK. Um, and then you will see in this, uh, from the screenshot here, um, that we have uh, configured Google as an external identity provider inside Keycloak. And here, on the right bottom, we set up Keycloak as an OAuth client in Google. Also note that we have introduced a new parameter for this to, in order for this to work. We're basically telling Keycloak that during the token exchange, it needs to use an external identity provider, Google, as the external issuer. Okay, so this is the one where I have to actually make sure I'm logged out. Um, bear with me for a moment. So as my user, I'm gonna kill my session. Okay, so there's no users for this session. But what you will see is, and for this, in, for this to, to work, you have to ensure that under identity provider links, um, you've got Google as the, um, uh, that Google has been associated with the user here. Now, in this example, um, we're gonna open up the collection, the collections, and this is demo three. And I'm gonna close that to give a get bit more room. I think I'm showing the end before I should. So what we're going to do is um, obtain a new access token, just like before. And now I'm going to be signing in with Google, signing into Keycloak with Google. Let's see if it works. And I'm gonna choose my Google account. And now Google needs, um, now Google wants to know that it's allowed to access my uh, calendar. So I'm going to allow that and proceed. And now we have a new access token here. So despite the, um, you will have seen that um, Google has authorized, um, so I've, I've allowed um, my app to have access, sorry, Google, I, I've granted permission for my app to have access to my calendar, and now I've got an access token. So let's have a look at what this access token looks like. Okay, you'll see, just like before, it's a regular key cloak access token. There's nothing, um, nothing different about it. So because my um, services within my infrastructure doesn't understand Google tokens, they only understand key cloak tokens. And now I can go ahead and use that token. And um, because the gateway has been configured to talk to Google's APIs, I can now browse the body of the request. And maybe I want to have access to my calendar, for example. So I can now send a request. Let's see if that works. Fingers crossed. And now I'm able to see, using the free busy endpoint of the Google API via the gateway, I'm able to have access to my calendar. Okay, so token exchange within Keycloak is in technology preview. Keycloak's token exchange implementation is loosely based on the OAuth token exchange specification at the IETF. And whilst it extends some aspects, it also ignores and loosely interprets other parts of the specification. And we do have some observations for the, um, for the implementers. So developer experience. We're not Keycloak experts, but neither are we complete newbies. Configuring Keycloak for token exchange is far from a simple task. Creating policies, client scopes, and mappers, and enabling token exchange for a client is very time consuming, error prone, and could greatly benefit from a simpler workflow. From building out our demo for this talk today, we found out that for internal to internal tokens, we have not yet been able to control the desired audience of the exchange token. 
we've gone through the documentation, we've tried to run through examples, and there's not much, there, there aren't any tutorials online that are, you know, that, are, that are comprehensive, and even the documentation, it does have warnings, but I think there's something that we're doing quite, you know, a little bit wrong. It's really difficult to configure it um, properly, and, you know, we're not able to control that audience, and we'd love to be able to do that. We just failed. <laughs> <laughs> we just failed miserably. Um, yeah. In addition, scope support is on the roadmap, but not yet implemented. Scope support is important because it enables us to define fine-grained permissions to an access token. And last one. Yeah, lastly, from what we see with the Keycloak implementation, Tight Gateway, by exchanging the token, has been able to impersonate the user, but it would also be useful if the web app would be able to delegate rights to the gateway. Um, in other words, Tight Gateway would like to be able to act on behalf of the web app. Um, and we'd like to be able to see this as part of maybe a composite, to, uh, as part of maybe a composite token support as, part, as per the specifications. This is because the user delegated rights to the web app and has no knowledge of the tight gateway. Okay. okay. So, um, first of all, thank you very much for listening to our talk. Um, you're welcome to come and see us in the L14 booth but, uh, and, and say hi. But first of all, if you have some questions, you can go to the mics on the, on the aisles and ask us something. We still have time. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. The, to the mic. Yeah. Just in the middle. Yeah. Don't fight. <laughs> Hi. Okay, so hopefully this is not too difficult of a question, but I was thinking to myself as you were talking about all, all these mechanisms to refresh tokens and exchange tokens, what if, I, what if my system is simple enough that I only really have one service? Does all of this still apply, or is there like a simpler setup that makes sense? So I think I can answer that. Um, if you've only got one service, then you're not needing to propagate the identity anywhere. But that one service, does it need to talk to third-party SaaS services or anything like that? Um, or if it has an API gateway in front of it? Yeah, should, should that gateway have the, be able to pass that access token around? How does the gateway know what's going to happen to it after it's, left, um, after it's proxied the request elsewhere? And I can't, I'm, I'm struggling to believe that there's only one service because you are using other third parties, like Ahmed said, for sure. And you're checking other stuff, even if it's just an API call, it's, a different, it's in a different trusted domain. So potentially you will improve your service, you'll add just something, you know, like just another thing, and you will find yourself passing on user, user information. Fair enough, thank you. Nice talk. That oh, was super, super good. Um, so my question regarding kind of performance and latency uh, increases and things. So uh, with the current authentication authorization flows that we might already have, if you've got multiple chains, like be on the gateway and a single service, and then that service calls with other services and it goes back, you probably want to do these sort of token exchanges on each call between each services to make sure that maybe like service C in the chain then needs to call service D and it doesn't want to pass on and do privilege, sort of passing the privilege of the token. Um, what sort of measurable, have you looked into performance issues of like doing all of these calls plus your own maybe authorization calls to your own authorization system? For permission? Take it, oh, it's right yeah. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we, we, we haven't measured the latency or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but what from, for, our, for our proof of concept and this, um, this middleware that we created, yeah. we, um, we implemented caching. So, um, so we, we're caching the, um, the signature of the initial access token, and we're looking up that. We're using it as the cache key. Yep. So that way, you're not having to re-perform the exchange when you receive the same initial access token over and over again. So then it's much, much faster. Quick. OK. Um, yeah. Thanks. OK. From, from that side, because... Right. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for the presentations and for the demos. I was wondering if you have any news about you know, um, token exchange being still in preview. It's a preview feature in Keycloak since a long time. Do you have any news when this could become a supported feature? 
we're, we're not in the key cloak team, so, uh, but they are here. Um, so, <laughs> well, I hope they hear you. Be Just behind you. <laughs> but I, I was wondering if you know anything about it. Like. Um, yeah, we're, we're not sure. Uh, we're not sure yet. So we're, we're keen to see it move on. And you know, I'd love to help the Key Cloak team to to make it. Um, you know, to, to make it awareness. GA and yeah. raise more awareness about the about the protocol as well. So yeah. No. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, my name is Thomas. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'm one of the Key Cloak maintainers, and we are currently working on revising. Uh, the token exchange support and getting it out of preview and uh, solving a lot of the issues that you mentioned there. So, I'd love to talk to you. <laughs> I'm going to come and see you. I'd love to help. So, thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, I've got a question about yeah. your middleware. How closely does it follow the RFC? Because obviously, Keycloak is very handy, but what if you want to write your own token exchange server? Sorry, did you say how, how closely does Keycloak follow the RFC? No, how closely, how closely does your middleware follow the RFC? Okay, we literally just built the middleware for the purposes of this talk. Right. Okay, so it does follow, it, it, and it works with Keycloak. So we haven't tried it with any other identity providers or anything like that. It works well with Keycloak. It's a pull request in draft mode, so it's not... Um, it's not bulletproof yet, but we're, you know, we want to move it forward and get the community um, playing with it, using it, and um, seeing if it works for them. So come and see us, Booth L14, and we can kind of talk about that and maybe give you a, a demo as well about it, uh, you know, um, and discuss your use case as well. Hi. I have... I have a question. Uh, do you happen to have any scale, uh, scalability data on this, uh, how well it works, at what scale? Have you uh, seen it work? Sorry. Well, it's, uh, well, I think we were asked that before. We built that as a POC. We do have caching. I hope I understood your, your question correctly, but we have caching for, for that token exchange. And for example, if you implement if you think about, for example, um, service mesh, where you have a gateway fronting an API, so every API call will, will go through the gateway, and the gateway is implementing the caching. So it, it is an extra hop, but then it depends on fine-tuning the caching. Right. Uh, I was looking for, like, uh, how many services have you tried with this, uh, like, in the number of services, microservices? You mean in a chain of uh, yeah. chain of calls? Yeah. Yes, it will add up. It depends on uh, the connection to the authorization server. However, there is value for that in terms of uh, security. So it really depends on what you're doing. And you know, if you need to uh, to make an API call to a less trusted domain, then it might be worth it, right? Okay. Thank you. And it will be faster than calling out to Google, so because obviously Keycloak will be in your own infrastructure, so that will be, you know, local network latency as opposed to going, you know, out over the internet into the cloud somewhere. Thank you for the great talk, and it was very useful because it also directly relates to what we are facing right now, uh, and figuring out that this option exists was <laughs> an amazing thing. Thank you, uh, but I have a question regarding long-lasting operations or whenever your gateway would need to schedule something happening in a long time away from the point that the request was made scheduling it, it might exchange the token right away and get a access token and a refresh token, but it will still need to push it somewhere for, uh, for the duration. Um, and the refresh token or the access token duration might expire during that time. How would you advise handling a situation like this? OK, just, we just got the message that we have to finish. But it's a really good question. Um, I don't think, if I remember correctly, it's not part of the RFC. So whatever you'll do depends on you know, specific implementation. It is really good idea to, th to think about that. I agree. And yeah, maybe we can think about it together. I'll drop by the booth, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, so in the That's demo that you gave, uh, you signed in as Google um, in order to exchange for a Google token. Is, is it possible to 
um, have the identity provider that you sign in and the third party service that you're exchanging for be different or do they have to be the same uh, identity? I think that's dependent on the identity providers or the, that's dependent on Keycloak and I think it's worth speaking to the guys that are here to understand how the, the mechanics of that works exactly. Okay. Um, because we have to ensure that the Google accounts are linked in order to be able to access the um, to, to to access that calendar. Right. So this is specific to Keycloak, and not according. You know, it's not a standard, and um, yeah. different providers will implement it in a different way. Yeah, and that part isn't, and the way that it's been implemented within Keycloak isn't actually part of that token exchange spec. It's just how they've leveraged those capabilities to enable this, this kind of feature. Right, okay. Thank you. So thanks very much. Slides are on the QR code if you're interested.